first of all, thank you for doing this. Oh, uh, my pleasure. My it's pleasure. been kind of uh, fun, I guess, really over the course of this season to get to know you, but I've known of you for a long time, and so it's it's something I'm I'm glad we finally have the chance to do this. And I just want to begin way at the beginning. Uh, where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in New York City, and I was raised in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, and until uh, I was 12 years old, uh, my father was the lead alto sax player on the Merv Griffin show. Wow. And so music was a part of how um, I was introduced to sound and, and engineers in general. And I used to go with my father to the taping of the show. Um, uh, to, uh, and, and I actually sat with him on the bandstand. Um, uh, it was pretty, pretty exciting as a young kid. Uh, I was proud of my dad, and, and he was one of the very best. And, um, and the show, and the reason for the move to California was the Merv Griffin Show moved from taping in New York to Los Angeles Okay. in 1971, I believe. So I was 12 years old. Wow. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's, that's where I was born. And uh, uh, moving to California was a little strange, a little awkward at 12. I had to leave all my friends, and at 12... Uh, your friends are everything, mm-hmm. and so it was kind of a t- tough transition mm-hmm. emotionally for me. Uh, I wanted a mini bike for years back in, back east, and my parents would say, "Absolutely not! <laughs> You'll kill yourself right. on that thing." They would not budge, right. and in through a slight depression as a twelve year old, um, they broke down and, and got me a mini bike <laughs> um, here in Los Angeles. But and that made it a little better. Yeah. Well. Throughout your childhood, were movies a big thing? Did you go to the movies a lot? And if you did, what, what kinds of movies did you like? Uh, I, 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 you know, my, my memories of, I loved the movies. I, I remember seeing with my dad, uh, believe it or not, The Dirty Dozen. Mm-hmm. And, and there was just something, going on a journey for a two-hour period and being transported to another place in time was fascinating to me. And... Uh, and obviously, I, I, I kind of always loved sound uh, anyway. I, I, if there was a bass and treble on, whether it was a stereo, mm-hmm. phonograph, anything, I was always kind of playing with that can, oh, that can I get a little more bass and it will sound better. So I was kind of always in tune with that. But I, I, I aspired to be, a, a, I wanted to make records primarily. And, and I studied with a wonderful uh one of the very best uh, recording engineers, Bill Lazarus, who has since passed. Um, and he was, he was my mentor uh, at the very beginning. I took his class at a, a recording studio, TTG, in Hollywood mm-hmm. that was owned by Ami Hadani. And uh, I was 17 years old and still in high school. Mm-hmm. And so, I, like I said, I went to recording studios with my father. I always saw that guy behind the board, and that interested me. And... All my friends seemed to be musicians. I gravitated to musicians. Uh, my dad wanted me to play. I, I uh, was asked, or not forced to, but saxophone, clarinet, mm-hmm. flute, which is all the instruments wow. my father played, woodwinds, uh, piano, etc. It required you to be alone, isolated, um, and you needed to practice hour, hour and a half, whatever it was. Not that I didn't like to be by myself, mm-hmm. but I liked to be around people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it just didn't go with my personality. And uh, so, but I loved being around musicians. And they always had like a little PA system. And I always found myself, hey, you know what? I think I can make the drums sound better. <laughs> and at 15, wow. 16, I was doing that. And, and so, needless to say, uh, you know, that kind of was inbred in me that, you know, it's just, I loved kind of mixing really early on. Uh, now, we talked about in, in previous conversations the fact that you your first steps into the film industry were on a, diff- <coughs> on a different side of it, not sound mixing, but actually within the film industry, you started out doing something de- else, right? Well, you know, I, I, I was working in, at, I did get this job at TTG. Right. Um, I was working with music, mm-hmm. you know, I was a young, young man just out of high school. Um, you know, I had my own personal challenges. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to have a good time. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I found myself, um, you know, having struggling with kind of drugs and alcohol and so forth. Um, I, I put together a kind of a, a pretty solid 
career as a young man. Mm -hmm. um, and up until I was, and I worked at TTG until I was like 22 years old and then moved to Evergreen Studios mm -hmm. in Burbank. Um, again, television scoring, motion picture scoring, a lot of record work, worked with got people like Harry Nielsen and, and so forth. And, and you know, there was a lot of, a lot of drugs mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is myself, uh, early, this is seven, this 70s? Is, this is early, uh, early 80s. Early 80s now, okay. Correct. This is 82. Okay. Um, and 82, 83. And, and lo and behold, I, I, got, I got caught in that and, and uh, from cocaine to various other things, and it had me. And I needed, I needed help, and uh, there was a gentleman who was in the industry with me and knew all of my behavior mm -hmm. and said, uh, um, if you ever need any help with this, give me a call. And he was someone, a very dear friend to this very day, wow. uh, Tommy D. And, and he was my Eskimo to Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, needless to say, in May 9th, 1984, uh, got sober. Wow. And, uh, and I'm so grateful for that because my career, uh, my life, um, changed that there was now hope. Um, I had talent, but that talent uh, wasn't going to survive with the, this, this addiction. And, uh, and I went through and, and did what they told me to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I worked the steps. I, mm -hmm. I participated. I, I uh, cleaned house, trust God, and I worked with others. And, and my life changed mm -hmm. radically. And I couldn't be more grateful. It's one. Of, it's probably my greatest gift mm -hmm. ever, um, and I've been able to help others um, through my life. And yet, my career now started to just take a completely different turn. And that's where I wanted to just interject because I, I, when things bottomed out on the other end of things, when you were right. involved with scoring, from what I understand, just from our prior conversations and stuff, you were sort of you were sort of told. Go until you can get yourself together. You gotta find something else to do, right? And so, how did it? How did that lead into once you did get yourself together? This I, new career. I, uh, I I believe it or not, I got a call from a, a small post production facility, um, and uh, a young man uh, named Jeff Abush was uh, was looking for someone uh, to join him at a little facility called B&B Sound. Mm -hmm. And it was at the time of which I was just getting clean. It was a transition I didn't, I didn't see coming in terms of moving from recording to re-recording. Right. But there was a small stage that he was now going to be taking over, and I actually joined him uh, and started mixing music because I had such a background in music. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how my re-recording career started, and we were doing a lot of cartoons, um, oddly enough, we actually did uh, mix uh, many Transformers <laughs> cartoons. That's amazing. So in terms of coming full circle yeah. of having the opportunity to work with Michael Bay on the Transformers uh, franchise has been pretty amazing. That is. But we did a lot of television, moonlighting, etc., a lot of small features. I worked there for five years mm -hmm. with, with, uh, with Jeffrey and uh, got a call from Don Rogers. Uh, at Warner Brothers, yeah. and Don Rogers was kind of like the 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 president president of the club <laughs> yeah, of of sound in the sound community, yep. in my opinion, yep. uh, and in many others as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was it was like talking to the president, <laughs> and he said, "Greg, I hear great things about you. <laughs> I'd love to meet with you." And uh, I uh, was honored, and he hired me to come over and work with Bob Litt and Elliot Tyson on Stage A. At Warner, at Warner Hollywood, it was like getting a call from the big leagues <laughs> mm -hmm. to, to to come up from Triple A <laughs> ball, right? You know, because I I had done fifty five feature films; they were all small. Yep. Most notable was probably John Waters' Hairspray, mm -hmm. the original, mm -hmm. um, but some cult things and right. uh, 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 films that went on to have a little following, but never an A film. And my first film there was with Robert Town directing uh, Tequila Sunrise. Wow. Um, and I was so honored to be in that room because everyone there was Oscar winners. He was as a mm -hmm. screenwriter for Chinatown. Mm -hmm. Kay Rose was a supervising sound editor, one for The River. Wow. Uh, the picture editor, Claire Simpson, who won two years prior to that in 86 for Platoon. Mm -hmm. I'm in this room mm -hmm. filled with kind of 
just really amazing, talented people. And I was just honored. I was just honored to be given that opportunity. So before we go any further, I have to ask you to clarify something for people like myself who I feel like I follow it, the industry pretty closely, but even I couldn't necessarily tell you specifically what a sound re-recorder versus uh, other types of sound mixers versus sound editors, what the d differences are between them. So can you, to begin with, when you say <coughs> that you are a sound recorder and you are, by all accounts, one of the best, if not the best at that, what is it? What does that specific job entail? And then what is the distinction between sound mixing, which that generally falls under, and sound editing? Well, to begin with, the, the mixer is on a film. The production mixer is the man in the field out with the movie recording the dialogue. Okay. That is his job, is to record the dialogue of the movie, not to get the effects or any of the... All of everything else other than the dialogue is prepared um, by, by the editorial team, and I'll get into that. Mm -hmm. So the production mixer on, on board which is the sound mixer you see credited on a film, is the production mixer during the shoot of the film. Mm -hmm. The re-recording mixer um, is the individual who, in, in our case, we have two. Uh, there used to be three, one handling music, one handling dialogue, one handling all the sound effects. And now, because of the technology um, allowing to being full digital consoles, uh, we've streamlined that to there's mostly two-man teams the dialogue mixer handling dialogue and music because music kind of comes and goes mm -hmm. and then so the the the, the work um, displacement is a bit more even mm -hmm. to, to and then the effects are kind of non-stop throughout a film backgrounds foley footsteps all of the foley sounds guns explosions uh, all of the uh, helicopters whatever mm -hmm. vehicles are in a movie are all on the effects side um, so the the, the dis distinction from sound editing is the sound editors are the ones that take the dialogue tracks and prepare them, make sure everything's in sync mm -hmm. um, from a dialogue standpoint, from, from the effects uh, sound editing, which are all the backgrounds, city sounds, mm -hmm. bugs, um, uh, atmospheres, mm -hmm. um, all of the vehicles. They, they go out and prepare, record specifically for that show, for instance, on Transformers, all the robot design, mm -hmm. all of those are all created and designed, all of these bits and pieces, mm -hmm. and there's hundreds and hundreds of tracks that create the likes of a Transformer. Mm -hmm. And so they are the ones to prepare the palette of sounds that then come to a stage like this, and I go through and actually mix and balance and pan all of the sounds, mm -hmm. um, equalize them, give some treatment so that they're in the natural if they're outside, you get slight reflections off buildings. Um, so all of that, the mixing of those elements are the re-recording job. And so in that process is a pre-dubbing, which is preparing the dialogue, mm -hmm. all the backgrounds, all the hard effects, explosions, and so forth, all the foley, and getting all of those balances and clean and everything sounding the way you want it to. Then we go into what is, and that process could take two weeks, three weeks, five weeks mm -hmm, on a movie mm -hmm. of this nature. Uh, and so all of the pre-dubbing is done, and then we go into what is called final mix. And that's when we introduce the score, mm -hmm. and the score is on one chunk of the console. Mm -hmm. All of the dialogue elements that have been prepared and equalized and balanced are here, and all the sound effects are on this side of the console, which is the, a big chunk of the console because mm -hmm. there's usually a lot more tracks mm -hmm. uh, within the effects. And so then we sit down with our producers, directors, picture editors, supervising sound editors, and we collaborate mm -hmm. in creating the final soundtrack to the film. So I guess that leads nicely into just a, a, the question about where do sound mixers, sound re-recorders do most of their work? And I guess that maybe that gives you an opportunity if you could tell us where we are right now. Well, we're, we're currently, right now, yeah. we are at the brand new Technicolor facility on the Paramount lot. This mm -hmm. is stage one. Mm -hmm. This is my new home, mm -hmm. um, uh, of which uh, I've joined here with Scott Milan. He's my mixing partner. And uh, it's a brand new facility built from the ground up with, um, with all the latest and greatest technology available to us. It's a phenomenal uh, facility. We're very proud to be here. Uh, it's the first time Paramount has ever had 
a, a full post-production facility. And uh, two and a half years ago, uh, I received a call from Adam Goodman, who just was up to um, uh, uh, head of production mm -hmm. here. And he said that, you know, if there's thought talks of building this, would you consider making a move? Because we'd love to have you here. Wow. And I said, absolutely. If it's done right, I would love Love that opportunity. I just have to interject. This was since you had been at Warner Brothers, you had then gone to Sony, and so the, he was contacting you about coming from Sony? Correct. I, I uh, Starting when I was moved from b and from 83 to 88, right. from 88 to 95, I was at Warner Brothers with Don Rogers and that entire group, which mm -hmm. was a, just a tremendous experience to, to work with people that I admired so much. And I, and I want to even go on record saying that when I was doing records, I, I went to one of the inspirational moments mm -hmm. to, wow, motion picture sound was in, I believe it was 80 or 81, I don't recall, uh, uh, when Raiders of the Lost Ark, mm -hmm. I went to see that movie at the Cinerama Dome, and it was in six-track, discrete, 70-millimeter, yada, yada, <laughs> and I sat in the middle of that theater, and I was in awe of what I was hearing. I thought, oh my God, I was listening to sounds that were rolling on that ball, mm -hmm. rolling over mm -hmm. your head, and the rumble of the room, and all of the surround activity, things were panning all around all the time, and, and, uh, and that movie was mixed, and they won the Oscar for sound that year, uh, uh, Bill Varney and uh, Steve Maslow and Greg Landaker, mm -hmm. and I was inspired, mm -hmm. I was inspired, and that's when I was in music, and thought, wow, if there was ever an opportunity to get to do something like that, that would be really cool. Right. And to go to Warner Brothers, this is where they were. Right. So I was honored to be working at the same facility that these guys were at. So it was a real privilege. But in 95, I did move down to Sony, and I had an amazing run there. I joined uh, uh, Kevin O'Connell, and I had done some films at Warner Brothers when he was there. And we got together at, at Sony, and we had a tremendous run together. Mm -hmm. Um, 12 years and many nominations, uh, some of my you know, best work. Uh, I, I'm very proud of the things that we did together. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, was, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. But after 16 years, uh, just about two months shy of 16 years, um, you know, this opportunity mm -hmm. uh, became a, a reality. And so I made the move. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I love those guys down there. It's a great department. Uh, Richard Branca and Tommy McCarthy, uh, the entire uh, post-production team there, they were, they were so kind to me and, and generous and supportive. Bill Beignet, my engineer, uh, oh, they're just, uh, you know, it's hard to leave. Mm -hmm. Their relationship, mm -hmm. these, it's family. Mm -hmm. You know, the, when you are entrenched with these people in trying to create the lights of films like this, this movie was mixed um, in, in the Kim Novak Theater uh, at Sony. And, you know, incredibly proud to be a collaborator mm -hmm. with really talented people. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful that I bring what I bring to the table. But I have to say that there are so many people that are behind the scenes, the mixed techs, the, the, that keep everything going, all the engineers. How do we figure out how to make this movie? How, we're stretching the boundaries each and every time on a movie of this magnitude. It's bigger, it's bolder, it's, it's more challenging, mm -hmm. more complex. This one is the most challenging film of my career. That's there, it. There is no doubt about that. Really? And no doubt. Now, and, what, uh, what makes it specifically that? What makes it that unusually challenging? Michael Bay raises the bar mm -hmm. each and every time we, we get together and work on a, a movie of his. And this is the eighth time, I think? This is the eighth collaboration mm -hmm. with, with Michael. I've been with him on every movie except his very first, which was wow. the very first Bad Boys in 95. But from 96, from The Rock to Armageddon to Pearl Harbor to, uh, it, it, to the Transformers films to Bad Boys 2 to The Island, mm -hmm. which I thought The Island was a very cool <laughs> yeah, movie. Yeah. And, uh, and, and yet, you know, it's just been incredible because he's such a visionary. Uh, his, I don't think anybody shoots action like Michael. Uh, it's just phenomenal. I look at these scenes early on and go, oh my God, how, how in the world has he come up with this? And uh, it's extraordinary. So, and he, he gives us such tremendous creative license and freedom to create. He certainly is, has his own ideas, 
and and his own vision. But he really lets us kind of go, and and then he'll re, re you know reel us in, and I like this, like that, don't want this, etc. Um, but this movie, being that it's a culmination of the first two were very challenging. Mm -hmm. And he said originally that we were going to tone the action down in the third one, be a more, you know, not so much sophisticated, but kind of intriguing, more mm -hmm. espionage. This movie actually has more action than the previous mm -hmm. two. Uh, one of our supervising senators says, I think it's, it's got the amount of action that both combined. <laughs> it is the biggest, uh, it's epic. It, the, the set pieces in this film are extraordinary, and they're and they're very difficult from a sound design standpoint as well as a, a mixing standpoint. Very difficult to do and make believable, and not be overwhelming. and And my main objective is to have uh, definition and detail. I want to hear all the nuances. I don't want it just to be loud and abrasive. I mm -hmm. want it to be creative and mm -hmm. enjoyable to 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 be listened to. Now, when a director works with when you work with a director, uh, or generally when, a, a, when sound teams work with a director, I guess let's take the case of this film. Michael Bay uh, is not a visual effects artist, necessarily. He's not a sound editor, sound mixer, and yet all of his films seem to be sort of defined by those being real strengths of them. That they're, it's not, you know, not to take anything away from the other elements, but they're not People don't remember their performances as much as the as the overall sort of immersive experience of seeing them, which is the sound editing and sound mixing and visual effects folks, you know, responsibility, which has been properly you know acknowledged this year with all three getting nominations. Right, right. So my question is just, what is the role of a director when if he's not the guy that's doing the sound effects or the sound mixing or the visual effects, and he's not necessarily not you know. Most people could not step in and, and tell you, you know, do this differently, do this. How can he influence the film? Well, he influences from the script, you know, mm -hmm. from the pages mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, of the script, which he's, you know, he's involved in. And, you know, his, the visions, um, his communication to the visual effects team as to what he wants this, this to be. I mean, the idea of uh, Driller, which is that snake-like, um, robot that is in probably one of the most sophisticated visual effect sequences ever done. I'm told that it crashed the server at <laughs> ILM. I t I'm told that it was to render this was the most uh, the complicated thing they've ever done. And uh, but yet that image, the idea was Michael's. So he communicates with them what what he thinks that that shot is and and describes it in pretty you know, in detail, and their execution of it then is an ongoing evolution of which he is deeply involved in it's, it needs to be this, it needs to be that. Um, and so he is, he does have the sensibilities, mm -hmm. his cinematic sensibilities from a visual standpoint is, is unbelievable, mm -hmm. unbelievable, uncanny, um, uh, because they, it really is. This is a Michael Bay film. I mean, we are all there to facilitate that vision from a visual standpoint as well as a sound standpoint. And obviously we have a lot more to go on because now we have images right. that we then can say, well, let's try this, let's do that. And Ethan Vanderen and Eric Adol are the supervising sound editors who are also acknowledged with nominations yes. this year, which I'm delighted because they, man, they do an unbelievable job. And, and do you guys work closely together when yes, you do? do? Okay. Yes, we do. And, uh, and so... They've been on board from the very first one, and, and we've learned a lot from working on the first one to the second one. We've learned how to streamline our, our execution, and, and we know Michael's involvement. He likes to hear things early on, preview sounds early, get his two cents in early on so that that evolving has his input throughout the process, and that's invaluable to us, so that when we do get to the final mix, he really kind of knows, and he's familiar with it, he's worn it, He's been able to experience it, and now we're just making subtle changes. We're not trying to unravel it or trying to discover what it should be. That's been an ongoing process. So uh, it's it's been a that's his that's his process, um, and and we welcome that because it seems to be a, a very efficient way to work. 
Just a quick follow up on that, though. You mentioned um, that his films are often promoted, a Michael Bay film. And that's not unique to him. People, a lot of directors now do that. But especially on a film like Transformers, which the credits must go on for hundreds of names, is that, is that necessarily fair? I mean, people talk about the auteur theory. It is the director's vision. And, but because of the fact that no director can do everything on a film, let al- on any film, let alone a film of this uh, sc- scope and scale, is that an, you know, is that something that sort of irks anyone, or do you, you know, get? No, I, I can tell you this. Uh, you know, that credit is that credit. We are we are all there to serve um, and 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 help bring to life, uh, you know, his vision. But he couldn't be more generous in in the support of his team. Of you know, he speaks. Uh, it's 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 uh, we're honored because he does give us. Um, Oh, let's say the credit that is due mm-hmm. for what what it is that we that our contribution is to the film, mm-hmm. and I've never felt for a minute that we were slighted in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, he really appreciates um, everything that everybody does, and we and he has people. I've been with him over sixteen years. Mm-hmm. Um, we we have shared a lot of laughs mm-hmm. together, and I have a lot of great Michael Bay stories. <laughs> uh, back to Pearl Harbor, back right. to Armageddon. Right that stay with me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, I, and I can say that I'm a better mixer as a result of working on Michael Bay films because wow. I've been challenged. Each and every effort has been, has had, I've had to raise the bar. He's raised the bar. I have to meet him there. We all do, mm-hmm. everybody. The expectations are high. And, and I welcome that because like I said, it's made me who I am today, uh, along with all the various filmmakers, Sam Raimi, mm-hmm. Philip Noyce, um, it's, it's been an extraordinary opportunity to work with such diverse talent and, and directors and film editors and, and other supervising sound editors that to get ideas, listen to how other people work. And uh, it's it, unbelievable. But Michael is a, um, it, it, it's, it, it's been probably the most rewarding um, because they are such obvious uh, examples of what can be done with sound and visual effects. He says that sound is 50% of the experience of his films. Um, It's critical. It is absolutely um, a focus that he has that this be believable and and real. And sound grounds these images Mm -hmm. and makes them believable. And uh, it's uh, it's been a very rewarding uh, uh, relationship. The last Same. thing that I'll bother you with is just this Oscar aspect of all of this, <laughs> which, I mean, obviously you don't come to work every day uh, with that on your mind, but it is one of the cool byproducts of, you know, doing what you do very well. True. And so just for people who may not know, this year was your fifth, brings your 15th nomination. We're now waiting to find out. I guess we're less than three weeks away from the Oscars now. Right. And you... Uh, share currently a spot in the history books that would I think you'd probably be very happy to to give up which is that aside from your former partner Kevin O'Connell who has a a few more you are uh, the most nominated sound mixer without having one yet and this goes back to 1989 your first nomination for Black Rain um, and it encompasses many of the films that you've mentioned already, including one year, I guess, 1998, where you were nominated twice for Mask of Zorro and Armageddon. And so my question for you to begin with, just, you know, do you feel that there's some... I want to I phrase this in, intelligently here. The, the, the people who work with you or who, do, who work in your field and know what it, it takes to do, they're the ones that pick the, nominee, the nominations each Correct. year. And right. they've saw it, they've seen it fit to nominate you 15 times. Then, for whatever reason, the Academy says that the people who weren't necessarily qualified to pick the nominees, all the other branches, makeup, you know, costume design, people who have nothing to do with what you do, are now qualified to pick the winners. And so, I, is it fair to say that that probably uh, leads to films being rewarded in these categories that are are more generally popular as opposed to specifically sound, you know, sound mixed, sound mixing examples of yeah. quality? Well, I don't, to begin with, it has been an honor to, mm-hmm. to be 
uh, singled out but from my peers, I, without question, because that is truly, uh, they know what it, what it takes to do this work. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet when it does go to the collective membership, um, in the same way that I really don't know from costume okay. design and art direction um, and in other categories that I'm just not, I'm not trained mm -hmm. in. Uh, they're not trained in sound. Mm -hmm. And not all the time, but some of the time, there are, there are years where simply the, the, the favorite film, mm -hmm. the, a best picture right. that, um, that is also nominated in the sound category, wins for sound when there might be several others that from, from the sound branch consideration might go a different way. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that happens, and, and that definitely happens. It would be wonderful um, for, uh, my wife had, had made a recommendation, you know, she said, what if, what if, in the same way that when we vote for our city council mm -hmm. and propositions, we get a pamphlet, a mm -hmm. booklet, that tells us what that proposition is. Otherwise, I don't know what Proposition 101A right. versus, I don't know what that is unless I read about it and get educated about it. And she said, what if the Academy sent out a little paragraph mm -hmm. that kind of describes so that when you are looking at these categories that you might not know, and mm -hmm. I would certainly benefit mm -hmm. from that myself in these other craft, yeah. if you want to call them categories, that there, there might be a better opportunity for them to kind of vote more accurately right. to the work rather than just maybe their favorite film. And so, I think that makes sense because like you're saying, it, it would seem that they're often just coattail winners in the other, in the, the lesser known categories. And, but, and I never want to seem like sour grapes no, no, no. and whatnot, but there, there's no doubt there, there are there are those times when I look at, even times when I wasn't nominated, right. and I knew that there would be a show that would absolutely win. If it was left to just the sound branch, this movie would win. And then it goes to something else because it happened to be the best picture of the year and embraced by, you know, the actors are the biggest, largest right. body of votes. They have 1,800 or some odd, some odd uh, members right, the in, in their branch. And, and so... Um, well, and they might be more inclined, therefore, obviously, to uh, reward performance-driven films as opposed to effects-driven exactly right. films, which, exactly you know, right. when over the years did you feel you had the, the, the best shot going in? When were you most optimistic? I thought on the first uh, Transformers in 07, yeah. being that it was such a groundbreaking film from a visual effects standpoint, these robots have never been seen, um, and it was new and fresh, and uh, and it you know, I, I, I thought we really had a great, great chance that year. I thought back on Pearl Harbor in 2000 uh, was one of my uh, favorite mixed films. Uh, extraordinary uh, to, to recreate the, that bombing sequence mm -hmm. that it was literally 20 minutes mm -hmm. of some of the most challenging work I've ever done mm -hmm. um, didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on a, on a number of occasions I thought we, we, had, we, had, we had it and it just didn't happen. After 15 nominations, do you, A, still get excited when you find out you've been nominated, and B, does it hurt if it, if it doesn't pan out? You know what? It, 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 I'm always thrilled, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm ecstatic. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the same as the first one 22 years ago on Black Rain? <laughs> Probably not, right. but it, it's still exhilarating. Right. There's nothing like it. It is a ride of rides. The, the 30 days from the moment that you're nominated till Oscar night is just such an incredible, incredible ride. Um, and it's just fantastic. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And if, 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 if I were to go on and never win, that, it'd be tough. But I still know that I've, 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 I've done what I love to do for a living. I'm very passionate about making films and collaborating with filmmakers. And that is the that is my cake that I that I relish that I get to do something that I love to do this much and earn a nice living and uh, and and this is just all a, a, a frosting on a great cake. And that being said, though, if you do win this year, what will that mean to you? And what do you think you'll you'll say? Will you? It'll be... it'll it'll me it'll it'll be uh, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It'll be incredible. Um, on behalf of my family and friends that have waited an eternity for this, um, it'll be extraordinary. Right. 
and I, I pray and hope that if it's God's will, uh, it will be. And if it's not, I will go on and, and work hard and do the best work I can do uh, each and every year. And, uh, but it's a privilege to be a part of this industry. Um, I'm very grateful.